Well, I want to know how many of you took Spanish in high school or college. Raise a hand. You took Spanish. Some of you know Spanish, so you don't need to take it, but Spanish. Okay, I took Spanish in high school, and uh, I went to this really good high school, and we were smart. There was a lot of smart people there, and uh, they were so smart that they recognized or knew that our teacher, our Spanish teacher, was taking the exams right out of the teacher's book from the Spanish book that they, she was teaching from and giving those same exams to us. And so somebody in our class thought, well, if the teacher is using the exams right out of the book, then that means the answers to those exams was also in the book. And so they bought the teacher's book and passed around the answers to the tests before they ever happened. And so I got, you know, the information of uh, what was going to be on the upcoming test. And, you know, I, I did study Spanish. Like I said, we were smart kids. We weren't, uh, we weren't messing around. We were, we were good. But, but somebody was offering the answers to the upcoming tests in our Spanish class. And so I took those in. And I, instead of studying Spanish for my Spanish test, I was studying the alphabet, if you know what I mean. <laughs> Multiple choice, you go into the test, A, A, C, D, F, A, A, C, C, D, E. 100%. Every time. You know, you go into the test, you know the answers. You know the vocab words that were going to be on the test, everything. You just knew. And so I thought, you know, it would be really bad if the teacher would find out that uh, I was cheating. And so I intentionally got a question or two wrong every time. And I knew which one I was going to get wrong because I had studied the answers to the exam before I had taken the exam. And uh, I hope this story kind of illustrates the difference between like an unintentional sin, an unintentional choice, and an intentional choice. Like... Like, you could be in a test, and you know, remember back in school, you know, you're taking a test, you're not quite sure about this one particular question, and you just kind of glance at the neighbor next to you, and they sort of kind of have their paper, you know, able, you could kind of see, and you're like, oh, I think that says a B, and I kind of got B, so like, ah, I'm probably good. Like, that might be unintentional. You didn't really mean to, like, move your eyes a little bit. But when you are studying and memorizing the answers to the test... Like, you can't just do that in a minute, right? You've got to, like, memorize it. My friends, that's intentional, right? <laughs> that's intentional. And so today, as we've been alluding to all morning, today we talk about a guy who was picking up sticks. And yes, picking up sticks guy is in the Bible. Why it's in the Bible seems confusing. Because what we have been doing uh, through this series is we've been seeing the nation of Israel as they've been in development, as they've left Egypt, and as they're heading to the promised land, and they've done some big things. But this guy who was picking up sticks, his punishment for picking up sticks was the death penalty, to which you're all supposed to say, what? What? The death penalty for picking up sticks? Are you serious? Like, this is the most insignificant, small thing that anyone could possibly do, and this dude was killed for it? That's crazy. Plus, if you've been here the last number of weeks, and if you're new, welcome to you. We're so glad that you're here. But the last number of weeks, we've been talking about all these big events. Like, you're like the nation of Israel. They, they melted down their gold, and they worshipped a golden calf. Like, I understand why that's in the Bible. Like, that's a no-no. But a guy picking up sticks? Really? Like, this seems so insignificant. Then, two weeks ago, we talked about in Numbers chapter 11 that the people started to complain about where they were going. And the Lord heard everything that they said. And you're like, I get that, right? We don't want to complain about what God is doing in our life. And they were complaining specifically about their diet. Remember, they were like, oh, I miss the garlic. You ever complained about garlic? The leeks were so good in Egypt. I want to go back to get some leeks and the cucumbers. I miss the cucumbers. The cucumbers were so good. Oh, the cucumbers. You know the cucumbers? You remember the cucumbers? The cucumbers, my friend, were amazing, and I miss the cucumbers. Who misses cucumbers? They miss the cucumbers. And as a result 
of their complaining, God brought a severe plague against them. And you're like, I, I understand why that's in the Bible. If you're complaining about cucumbers, you've got a problem, right? The next week, last week, we talked about in Numbers 12 where Miriam and Aaron were criticizing Moses. They're criticizing Moses. And God, as a result, punished Miriam with giving her leprosy. And again, you're like, I, I get that. But a guy picking up sticks? That seems so irrelevant, so just out of the blue. And what happens after Numbers 12 is Numbers 13. <laughs> and uh, 13 and 14 are one of the most pivotal moments in the nation of, his, uh, of Israel in their development. They're coming out of Egypt. They're going towards the promised land. And they get to the promised land. And so they, God tells them to send out 12 spies to go into the land. And they go check it out. And 10 of them came back afraid, insecure, and unwilling to go. And so they come and they tell everybody, we can't go in here. We can't do it. And all the people, like, they believed them. And Joshua and Caleb were the two guys that said, we can go. We can take it. I believe God promised us this land. He told us it was a promise. And I'm going to believe God and we're going to go take it. And those two guys who believe God, they were wanted to be stoned. Like, they were the target of a stoning operation by the people which means you throw big stones at them to try to kill them. And so as a result of this, God condemns this generation to wander in the wilderness for 40 years. So they're wandering in the four, for 40 years, and the 10 guys who came back and didn't believe God, who spread this bad report, those 10 people, well, God wiped them out. And then the people are like, God, I didn't realize this was such a big deal. God, I didn't realize that you actually wanted us to trust you. God, I didn't realize that you were actually going to like take action against people that didn't believe you. So God, I'm so sorry. I did not realize that you meant this. So we're going to go into the promised land now and we're going to take it. And God's looking at them like, you are crazy. And so they go in and of course they lose. They, they get wiped out. It doesn't work for them. And so with all of that happening, do you really think that the nation of Israel was ready to go into the promised land? Like, they didn't even want to go there to begin with. They wanted to go back. They, didn't, they were complaining against God. They were criticizing their leaders. They didn't know who to listen to. They didn't know what to do. They didn't know what they were doing. They didn't know how to do it. And as good as it would have been to just go into the promised land the first time, they needed a little bit of development, didn't they? And what we see as punishment from God, like you had to wander 40 years in the wilderness, what we see as punishment from God was really development from God. And, and what we see as unnecessary like they should have just believed God in the first place and walked right into the promised land they should have just done it right the first time what we see is unnecessary is actually a necessary part of development and so if that's true then wouldn't you think the same is true about your life like you could look at all the bad stuff in your life and think that God was punishing you. You could think that. You're like, yeah, you know, my bad choices led to some bad consequences and God was punishing me. You could think that. Or maybe instead of beating yourself up for all of these things, you could believe that God was using those things to develop you into the person that God created you to be. That God had placed this potential in your life that he wants you to live into, that he wants you to find, that he wants you to use, and he's using all of these things to develop you to actually get there. And really what you think of all of this is, is that you are learning more about who God is, and you're learning to trust him more in your life. And so the people... Well, they were worshiping an idol, 
They were complaining about their food. They were criticizing Moses. They were sort of kind of wanting to go into the promised land, but then they changed their mind, and then they wanted to kill the people that believed that they could go into the land, and then God killed the people that didn't believe they were going to go into the land, and then they wanted to go into the land anyways, and then they lost. <laughs> and today, we're talking about a guy who was picking up sticks. <laughs> So if you've ever felt like you were somehow better than the people in the Bible, you know, you hear these stories and you were like, I would never melt down my gold and worship a golden calf. I would never do that. I can't believe they did it. I would never do that. Or like when you go into the promised land, you send out the 12 spies and you're like, pick me, I'll be number 13. And you'll go into the promised land and you're going to come back and of course... You would be with Joshua and Caleb. You would be a believer. Like, of course, we're going in. God promised it. I get to take it. God promised it. I'll have it. Of course, I'd be the one. I'd be standing cheering. I'd say, come on, everybody. Believe God. Of course you would. Well, if you think that you're right with God because you're doing all the right things, this story today is for you. Because my dude today is picking up sticks. He's doing this mundane, insignificant, everyday kind of task that anyone could do. And a, the most severe punishment comes his way for it. And so we'd all better pay attention, don't you think? And so we got to figure out why. We got to figure out why. So if you have your Bible, turn with me to Numbers chapter 15, if you're not there already. Numbers is one of the first books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers. Numbers chapter 15 is where we will be. If you don't have a Bible, we'd love to send you home with a free Bible. You can grab one in the lobby before you leave today, and as you see, the words are also on the screen as well. And so we're going to get to this guy with sticks, I promise you, I promise you. But Numbers 15 starts by talking about sacrifices and offerings. And so Moses is giving these commands to the nation of Israel, and some of them like, go like this. Like, if a sacrifice is a ram, give a grain offering of four quarts of choice flour mixed with a third of a gallon of olive oil, and give a third of a gallon of wine as a liquid offering, this will be a pleasing aroma to the Lord. And you're like, that's kind of strange. And like oddly specific, right? And like if that's in the Bible, like if God gave us something so specific to do, and we believe the Bible is the word of God, shouldn't we be doing that? Shouldn't we? Well, it's a great question. And you need to know the answer to that question. Why aren't we? Because if God spelled it out, so clearly and you're not doing it and i'm not doing it our church ain't doing it either god's wrong or we're wrong <laughs> right what's that what's happening and so to know the answer to that question is so important and the answer to that question let me tell you is jesus <laughs> that's the answer is jesus because jesus comes along a couple thousand years after Moses gives the nation of Israel these commands, and Jesus changes everything. We live 2,000 years after Jesus, right? And so Jesus comes along, and he says he didn't come to destroy all of this law type stuff. He came to fulfill it. And so when we read about offerings and sacrifices, Jesus was the ultimate sacrifice. He was the perfect offering. And when Jesus looked at all these laws, he did them all perfectly. He fulfilled them all perfectly so that we wouldn't have to. But Jesus also summarized all of these things into two. He's like, love God and love other people. And that was his message. And then, like, a couple days before he was killed, he summarized the entire thing to one. Now, one command was to love one another as I have loved you. And so we follow Jesus. Jesus changed 
everything. And so why do we take the time then to study a book like Numbers? Because we're not doing it. Well, you, you study something like this to learn more about God. God has not changed. You learn more about him and how he relates to people, how he relates to you. And so like one of the things that's really interesting in Numbers chapter 15 here is verse 15, where it says, native-born Israelites and foreigners are equal before the Lord and subject to the same decrees. Which this verse is fascinating because as the nation of Israel develops, you have the Jews and the Jews were extremely nationalistic, aren't they? And so like when Jesus is walking around, you read in the Gospels in the first century, like the Jews, literally, like even the ones that were closest to Jesus, like a guy named Peter, Peter never was in somebody's house who wasn't Jewish. Can you imagine that? Never being in somebody's house who wasn't the same nationality as you. Talk about extreme nationality, right? They're like, we're the chosen people. We're the chosen ones of God. We got the right ancestor. We're, we're Father Abraham's children. Like, we're good. We're with God. Everybody else, ooh, good luck to them. But we're right, and we're good. And so you got Peter, who's like, God's like, Peter, go to this guy's house. And Peter's like, what? God's like, yeah, go, go to his house. Peter's like, okay, I can go to his house. Now God's like, go inside. And Peter's like, what? Like, if I go in there, I'm going to die, or I'm going to get contaminated or something. And so Peter finally is like, okay, God. I trust you. And he goes in this guy's house for the first time, like in his entire life. That, this is the nationalistic understanding that the, developed over the years. But this is the very beginning in Numbers. And we see God's heart. And what's his heart? That the foreigner and the Jew were all equal. We're all in this together. The Jew and the Gentile before God is all the same. So I, I love seeing that. And this also is kind of interesting. Uh, jumping down to verse 20, it says, Present a cake from the first of the flour you grind, and set it aside as a sacred offering, as you do with the first grain from the threshing floor. And what you can see from these offerings and many others is the principle of how important the first is. Like what you do first really impacts what happens later. And the same is true with your spiritual life. Jesus taught us this, that he said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and everything else that you're worried about will be added unto you. Like there's something about what's first that's important. Our first and our best is what God deserves. He doesn't deserve, he doesn't deserve our leftovers. Think of it this way. You invite your very special friend over to your house. And you're going to have a meal. It's going to be a good time. And maybe, you know, they're a super special friend. Maybe it's a really important person. You're hosting a very VIP, you know, whoever that is to you. They're coming over. You're so excited. And they come, and they're like, oh, yeah, how's it going? We had a good week. Oh, yeah, that's good. Oh, you're hungry. Oh, oh, yeah, we're having dinner tonight. Okay, so you go in, you open up the fridge, and you start looking through all your containers in there, and you, like, pick one, and you open it, and you're like, oh, jeez. You have any of those containers or just me? It's been in there a week too long, right? You're like, that is not good. So you go over to the trash can, dump it out, shake it out. So you go back to the, fr you go back to the fridge, you open it up again. You're like, I think I had some Chinese food from the other day. So you're looking in there, you kind of smell it, and you're like, oh, yeah, yeah, this got like one day left. Anybody, anybody, one day? You're like, one day. All right, so you, you tell your friend, you're like, I'll put this in the microwave. Here, we got dinner, Chinese food from, you know, it's got one day left. You would never, you would never do that. Why do we do that with God? Right, our first and our best. Our first and our best of our time. Our first and our best of our resources. Our first and our best of our possessions. Our first and our best of our money. God, this is for you. Leftovers? No. So we can pull out some of these things, right, as we're looking at these texts and numbers. And, but you're like, if I, if I lived in this time, right, as many people did, if I was actually under this law, if I actually had to follow all of these commands, how would I do that? 
Like I read something like this, present a cake from the first of your flour to grind. Like what kind of cake? Some of you are like chocolate cake, <laughs> vanilla cake. <laughs> What kind of cake? How, what exactly is a cake? And plus, like the verses prior, how do you measure like a third of a gallon? How do you measure a couple quarts? Like what happens if you just measure a little bit more or a little bit less? Is that okay? Is it wrong? Is it bad? Did you do good enough? It's great questions. And it, guess what? God knew that this was going to be a problem. God knew that you couldn't do it. Nobody could do it exactly right. And so, thankfully, God did something about it. He gave the people a way to cover their unintentional sins. Right? They're trying. They're doing their best. They didn't really mean it. And so God's like, well, it's still not right. And so you're going to need something. You need a sacrifice. You need a sacrifice. Like, you're trying, but no matter how hard you try, you can't do this. So you need a sacrifice. And I want to read a number of verses here, starting in verse 22, that talk about this principle. So you can follow along. But, but suppose you unintentionally fail to carry out all these commands that the Lord has given you through Moses. You know, you make a chocolate cake where you're really supposed to do a vanilla cake. You measured a little bit more than a third of a gallon. You should have done a little less. You know, that type of thing. You stubbed your toe. You spilt everything all over the place. You messed up. Suppose your descendants in the future fail to do everything the Lord has commanded through Moses. If the mistake was made unintentionally and the community was unaware of it, the whole community must present a young bull for a burnt offering, a sacrifice, as a pleasing aroma to the Lord. It must be offered along with its prescribed grain offering and liquid offering and with one male goat for a sin offering. Verse 25, with it, the priests will purify the whole community of Israel, making them right with God, and they will be forgiven. For if it was an unintentional sin, they have corrected it with their offerings to the Lord, the special gift and the sin offering. The whole community of Israel will be forgiven, including the foreigners living among you, for all people were involved in the sin. But if one individual commits an unintentional sin, the guilty person must bring a one-year-old female goat for a sin offering. The priest will sacrifice it to purify the guilt person before the Lord, and that person will be forgiven. These same instructions apply both to the native-born Israelite and to the foreigners living among you. Right? Everyone is the same. This is the same for everyone. And there's a sacrifice that needed to happen in order to cover the sin, to forgive the sin. And so let's make this super practical for you in your life today. This is, this is good stuff, all right? So listen up, listen up. This is our developmental application on this particular point. Let's say somebody sins against you now i know this never happens but like in a different world where people were mean and nasty and said bad things and looked at you wrong when people like slammed the door in your face like a world like that i know it's not the one that we live in but like in a world where that actually happens and somebody sins against you unintentionally what do you do what do you do when somebody sins against you unintentionally what do you do well what you do is you forgive them and you move on, right? You get over it. You know, the scriptures say love covers a multitude of sins. This is 1 Peter 4, 8. Just let it go. Some of you are holding on to grudges against a person because they looked at you weird. Why would you do that? Maybe... Their face just looks weird. <laughs> they weren't looking at you weird. Their face looks weird. Or they had an itch, you know? They have no clue that you're holding all of this against them because they looked at you strange. <laughs> they have no clue about that. And if they did know that, if they did have a clue, oh, man. They'd be like, I'm so sorry you feel that way. 
please forgive me, right? Like, I didn't, they didn't mean anything. And your relationship with them is more important than hanging on to, well, they looked at me weird, right? So just deal with it, you know? That's how God designed us human beings to operate and to function. Like, if, if you ever, like, there's not a lot of magic pills or magic bullets in this world. Like, a lot of things take time. A lot of things, you know, you put effort and work and energy, and it might work, it might not work. But if you ever want a magic bullet to fix your relationships, this is it, okay? This, this is, it works 100% of the time, and it's so easy to implement, okay? What you do if somebody sins against you unintentionally is you, number one, you forgive them, right? You say, God, I forgive them. Then you go to the person, see, someone's taking notes. Then you go to the person and you say, hey, what you did hurt me. And the other person says, oh, I didn't realize that it hurt you. Please forgive me. And then you say, I forgive you. Boom. Perfect. <laughs> this, every time, 100%, out of 100, 100 times out of 100 times, it's going to fix your relationship. Somebody say, it's going to fix my relationships today. If I just do this, right, you forgive, you co confess it, you move on, and you do it 100% of the time. <laughs> so you forgive, and you move on 100% of the time. We're good. We're good. But you know that relationships sometimes are not that easy, right? And why is that? Because some sins are not unintentional. Look what Numbers 15 goes on to say. But those who brazenly violate the Lord's will. I know what I'm doing, and I'm just going to do it anyway. Whether native-born Israelite or foreigner, they have blasphemed the Lord. And they must be cut off from the community since they have treated the Lord's word with contempt and deliberately disobeyed his command. They must be completely cut off and suffer the punishment for their guilt. See, there is a difference between an unintentional sin and an intentional sin. There's a difference between kind of stumbling on the answers to the exam on your neighbor and you're like, I think that looks like a B, to studying the answers to the test before the test comes. There's a difference. And so Moses gives an illustration of this difference. He wants to illustrate to you and to whole, all of history what an intentional sin looks like. And so he says, there's a guy picking up sticks. Here we are. One day, while the people of Israel were in the wilderness, they discovered they're in the wilderness wandering. They're, six, they're 40 days, 40 years in the wilderness. They're starting that journey. And they discover, it wasn't like they went out hunting for this guy. They just stumbled upon him. They discovered a man gathering wood. And you're like, again, this is a man gathering wood in the Bible? Are you serious? Why is this a big deal? Well, the next three words say, four words, on the Sabbath day. And some of you are like, oh, now I know why it's a big deal. And others of you that are just like, I still don't know if it's a big deal or not, hang in there, okay? Like, this is, this is the issue. This is the thing. And so what happens next? The people who found him doing this took him before Moses, Aaron, and the rest of the community. They held him in custody because they didn't know what to do with him. And the Lord said to Moses, it's okay. He was just collecting sticks. Let him go. And that's why you need to read your own Bible. <laughs> because that is not what God said. Right? That, that's no. Right? That's what we would expect God to say. He's picking up sticks. Let him be. But no, that's not what God says. Remember, this is a deliberate sin. This is Moses illustrating what a deliberate sin looks like. A very intentional, I know the rules, I know the consequences, and I don't care. This is Moses illustrating this. And so how did he know the rules? Well, Exodus 35. 
Then Moses assembled all the congregation of the sons of Israel and said to them, these are the things the Lord has commanded you, right? He, he brings everybody together. This guy, this unnamed random guy who was collecting sticks, he's probably there in the crowd. And Moses is telling him, for six days work may be done, but on the seventh day, you shall have a holy day, a Sabbath of complete rest to the Lord. Whoever does any work on it shall be put to death. And then it's like Moses kind of leans in a little bit, and God kind of like grabs this guy by the collar, and he's like, he looks through history. I mean, they didn't know this was going to happen. This is years and years later. But it's like he's looking through time, and he's looking right at this guy, and he's like, you shall not kindle a fire in any of your dwellings on the Sabbath day. So, back to Numbers. There was that day where the people were in the wilderness. They discovered this man on the Sabbath day, and they found him, took him before Moses and Aaron and the rest of the community. They held him in custody. They didn't know what to do. And the Lord said to Moses, the man must be put to death. And so the whole community must stone him outside the camp. And so the whole community took the man outside the camp and stoned him to death. That's where you get big stones and throw them at somebody until they die just as the Lord commanded him. My man was collecting sticks. What makes it worse is like he wasn't even making a scene about it, right? These people like stumbled over this guy. It wasn't like he just was making a big deal about it. Like he was just literally collecting sticks. And compared to all of the other things that we talked about today that the nation did, this seems so small. So insignificant. Like he wasn't worshiping a golden calf. He wasn't criticizing Moses. He wasn't not trusting God about going into the land and spreading a bad report. This dude was just picking up sticks. And yet, out of all the choices, out of all the sins that Moses could have picked to illustrate what a deliberate sin looks like, Moses picks this guy. Because this guy knew he was wrong. He knew the punishment, and he still chose to do it anyways. My friends, the little details matter. The little choices you make, they really matter. And you might not be collecting sticks today. (laughs) You might not be collecting sticks and be like, but you still completely understand what you're doing. Right? You don't misjudge what you're doing. You misjudge God's response to what you're doing. And you might not be waving sticks in the air saying, hey, hey, God, what are you going to do about this? But we're waving a myriad of other things in the air. God, what are you going to do about this? God, God I know. I'm going to step on some toes. I know what you say about anger, God. But watch this. Oh, I know, I know what you say about gossip. Oh, but watch this. I I know what you say about witchcraft. Oh, but watch this, God. What are you going to do, God? Deliberate acts of defiance against the Lord. So what do we do with a story like this? What do we do? What do we do? Why does the scriptures record this for us to learn from, to grow in our faith with? Is it, is it number one, is it most important that we should all, after the service, go outside, grab some stones, and throw them at Kevin for deliberately studying the exam, the Spanish teacher, deliberately cheating? What about you? Should we do that for you too? Should we? If we're still under the old law, the old covenant, then we better or else we'd be disobeying God, right? But we're not. This was 2,000 years before Jesus. Now we live 2,000 years after Jesus. And Jesus had an opportunity to stand in a moment with all of these people that were ready to stone this woman. And they could have. He could have. The law said to do it. But Jesus steps in and said, hey, you without sin... You, you throw the first stone. And what happened? One by one, all of the people disappeared. And there was only one person 
in the crowd that day that didn't have any sin? His name was Jesus. And he could have threw the first stone, but he didn't. Instead, he said, your sins are forgiven. Go and sin no more. And this is God's heart for you today. Right? He wants you to see the gravity of your sin, the weight of your sin. Like it really deserves death. But the free gift of eternal life is through Jesus. Like he was killed on a cross so that you wouldn't have to be. He literally died the death that you deserve to die. And so instead of trusting in your own good deeds, what you think is going to make you right with God, you just got to trust in Jesus, that he did what you could never do. You got to trust solely on Jesus because you know this, sacrifice makes things right. And even an unintentional sin demanded a sacrifice, right? That animal had to die. And in the case of this man who was collecting sticks and deliberately breaking God's law, well, he deserved to die. And you broke God's law too. And I broke God's law too. And so I and you deserve to die. But my friends, we're here today to worship a God who died in your place so that you would not have to. And he was buried and he rose again. And when you trust and believe in him, you have eternal life. And I just pray today for you that if you have never like, understood the gospel in that way, like today is a new start for you, a new beginning for you. Like believing that Jesus did everything for you in your place is the beginning of a completely transformed life. It's the best decision that you could ever make. You trust him and him alone to save you. And if you need to do that today, just, just call out to him, cry out to him, pray something like, Lord Jesus, I'm trusting in you alone. There's no way I could get to heaven without you. Thank you for dying for me. Something like that. And then you can write it on your connection card. You could tell me afterwards, say, hey, Kevin, I've never heard that like that before. And I'm trusting in that today. I'd love to celebrate with you. It's the best thing ever. And then, I got two more points. In development, as we develop, we got to remember our choices have consequences. And if there's an unintentional sin, an unintentional choice that happens, like, it needs forgiveness, right? You need to forgive. You need to own up to it. You need to just make it right, right? Just, just deal with it. But if it's a deliberate choice, that just might be a deal breaker, and we need to know that. Like, if we deliberately choose to not do the right thing, it just might be the end. You might get fired if you do that. Like, you might lose a really good friend if you do that. You might end up in jail if you do that. So our choices have consequences. And lastly, I want to tell you that the little details matter. Like it may seem insignificant to you, whatever it is. And you think, well, my little sin, my little choices, well, they're just, they're just for me. You know, it's not really hurting anybody. Nobody needs to know. Everything will be fine. And if you're saying that today, if you're believing that today, I just kind of want to warn you that eventually, I don't know when, but eventually you will find out that that's just not true. Every little choice you make really, really matters. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you that you are the perfect sacrifice in our place for us. That God, because of our unintentional and intentional choices to sin, <laughs> there's nothing we can do to be made right with you. We deserve death. And God, that is why you came to this planet. That is why you lived a perfect life. That's why you died on the cross. Because 
you were dying, not for your own sin, God, but for mine. And so, Lord, today I just pray for all of us that we would all see ourselves at the foot of the cross, all equal, all together, not, not, no levels between, well, I'm better than her, or I'm better than him, or I didn't mess up as much as he did, or I didn't do that or that. I, I must be better than him. No. If a guy picking up sticks could get the death penalty, I think we're all in the same boat. And Jesus, you want to save us. You did everything possible in order to save us. And you want to give us new life. And so today, I just pray that we would trust you, that we would believe in you, and that we would know that every little moment, every little detail really, really matters. And today, if that moment is to put our faith and trust in you for the first time or the first time in a long time, I can't wait to celebrate that decision. And all of the angels in heaven can't wait to either. And so we ask that you would work in our life now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.